Good morning. Hasn't the Lord given us a beautiful day today? Amen? Amen. And we, we just praise him for it, thank him for it, and may we use this day to bring glory to his name as we should every day. Welcome to our time of worship. Before we start the service, we just want to bring a few announcements like usual. Uh, please use your bulletins and uh, because I'm not going to cover everything. And there's, of course, an extensive prayer list there for you, for your church and community to pray for. Uh, our Pray and Go Outreach, we're going to postpone that and start that on June 22nd. There's already a, no a note about that, that on Wednesdays in uh, the summer here, we're going to again resume our Pray and Go uh, ministry into the neighborhoods. That's going to be on Wednesdays at 630 Again, I hope you'll join us. We're going to give you more information about that so you can prepare uh, on that time to join us through the summer. Uh, this being the first Sunday in June, we begin a new uh, discipleship quarter in Sunday school. And again, I invite you to join us there. We have a lot to offer for all ages. And again, it's never too late to join us in that discipleship time. On your prayer list, one update. Uh, Kim Albright, we've been praying for Kim. She recently suffered a stroke and a car accident, and she's recovering mainly from the strokes. The car accident, she didn't receive any injuries. Uh, she was at Reading Hospital for a period of time, and just on Friday, she was transferred to Wellspan Rehab Hospital over at Apple Hill. So remember Kim, her husband, Walter, and family in your prayers as re she recovers. I have a note from our head trustee, Brad Schof. Two announcements. Today at 1145, we will be taking down the pulpit and installing the curtain for VBS. So Brad is of the assumption that I'm going to be done by 1145. And everybody laughed together. Uh, you know, Brad, I think we will be right around that time, 1145. So we need to move this here. We gotta install some curts, curtains here and other things for VBS. So a transformation will be happening this coming week and next Sunday you'll arrive with a, a different scenery and that'll be a, our VBS themed uh, time. Also, we want you to know and invite you Monday night at 4.30, tomorrow night at 4.30, we're taking down the tent that is at the pavilion that we used for the yard sale. And uh, it's easier to take down than to put up. And so we need some hands to help us uh, fold up the tent and to pack it away. And we appreciate your efforts to do that with us tomorrow night at 4.30. Guys, again, remember, we need to remove the pulpit at 11.45. So I can see myself here up front preaching, and all of a sudden some guys come walking behind me carrying this off while I'm preaching, but I hope not. But uh, there's many more announcements. Please uh, be aware of what's going on in the life and ministry at St. David's. So occasionally we hear this, I didn't know, but it was in the bulletin. And also it's in the newsletter that you get already at the beginning of the month. And also I hope you get our weekly midweek email to kind of give you an update of some things that develop during the week and we inform you of that. So uh, much is going on, especially VBS, be in prayer for that. And we have a special presentation on VBS right now. Chris, what are you doing? Don't you know church is going on right now? I'm creating a, I'm creating a monument. You know, so that's on VBS. Monument? What do you mean monument? Well, I saw a sign about monument, monumental VBS, so I figured you need lots of monuments, right? Maybe a statue of your senior pastor, Pat. I mean, 
I've never actually done one of these before, so I'm not sure what it would look like, but I figured I'd give it a shot. I think you misunderstood. We're, we're doing monumental VBS. But then again, abstract things are really in. I mean, the Washington Monument looks nothing like George Washington, and everyone loves that thing. No, you, you don't need to. Oh, that's not good. I'm kind of getting into this. Maybe this will just be a model and I can carve the real thing out of a mountain. But do you think that it needs to have the pastor's nose on it? Well, ask Lori what she thinks. <laughs> hmm. You know, if you look at it this way, it's actually starting to look like you. That's kind of sad. Let me see about that. Huh. I think you might be right, Chris. But you don't need to make a monument. Monumental VBS isn't about statues. Think God's monuments, like Monument Valley and the Grand Canyon, a vast desert with towering cliffs and butts and red rock. It's an epic week of celebrating God's greatness. And you're sure you don't need a monument? Nope, not even one, unless Lori wants one for her backyard. <laughs> but hang on to that thought. I uh, think we might be able to use this for VBS. Yeah, because if I destroyed it, I think Jeff Starn would be mighty upset. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> if you haven't signed up yet or registered or heard the news, next week, well, not this coming, but the following week, this stage is going to be filled with monuments, cactuses, and the likes. And we plan on filling this church as God has given the vision for Monumental VBS to journey with children through the story of Joseph. Um, and we're excited to hear the laughter, the noise, and the games that are going to go on as the fellowship continues and the hearts are taught as to who God is and why he loves them so much. Yeah, it's never too late to sign up, so if you'd like to join us next week for VBS, even if it's one or two days, please contact Chris, myself, and we'll find a spot for you. We are the ones that are blessed. We get such a blessing out of the week of VBS, and we so look forward to uh, our sanctuary being filled with the sound of laughter from, from children. And uh, be in prayer for our VBS and our ministry here, that um, the seeds that we plant, that God will uh, help to flourish. And... Um, we thank you in advance for all your support and through prayers and the monumental gifts as well. So um, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing what God has in store for us next week. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, today is Pentecost Sunday. And you may say, what is that? Well, it's the day we commemorate, really, in a sense, it's the beginning of the church, some would say. Of course, it was the coming of the Holy Spirit and uh, upon the church. And uh, we're going to start by hearing this, what the scriptures say happened at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygeria and Pamphylia, 
Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Amen. This is the word of God. Please stand with me. Why don't you just briefly turn and welcome those that are around you as the praise team comes to lead us in song. Welcome this morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. Can you hear me? I don't feel like I'm on, but okay. We're glad to have you here this morning, and I hope you will join us in song as we start out this morning with Great and Mighty. <clears throat> hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and our next song is entitled Holy Spirit You 
God's word, the whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. And we're going to finish up today with I Stand in Awe. of praise. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, by your spirit, and in your creation, that we might stand in all of you. You alone are worthy of praise and glory and honor, for you have created all things. Let us never neglect to give you the praise that you are due. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. There's another scripture reading for this morning, and this scripture reading is Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even... On my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, 
and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is God's word. Our next worship is going to be hymn number 259, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Children are dismissed to junior services at this time. Breathe on me, O earth of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Till my heart is pure, until my will is one with thine to do and to shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Please bow your heads and pray for, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, as we celebrate today, the day of Pentecost, Lord, we look back at the past few weeks and the tragedies that we've seen, that we've heard, the hearts that have cried out in sorrow, the tears that have fallen because of pain and anguish. And Lord, and we know not why these things happen, God, we don't understand it. We probably never will. But God, is, there is pain, there is suffering, there is anger, there is hatred. Lord, may you be with those who are in mourning. May you be with those who are going through suffering. And Lord, as the stories continue to come out, as to the events that happened in Texas, Lord, may you bless those who are affected who are supporting, and who are helping. Lord, bless the wood shop that provided what was needed within hours. Bless the trucking company that was able to get everything from Georgia to Texas within a day. And bless all of the hands that showed up in Texas in the little town to help paint and prepare. And God, be with the parents the husbands, the wives, the families. Lord, be with the victims as it's easy for us to have compassion and mercy for the families who knew some of the victims. And Lord, it's, it's harder to have compassion and mercy for the person who committed it. But Lord, may we have that in our hearts as we continually pray for all those who are hurt. 
And Lord, as we celebrate this day, the day that your son went up, Lord, we look forward to the day that he will return. As the angel said, he will return the same way that he has gone. And God, we look forward to that day. The day when you take your, your kingdom back from all the horrible things that are occurring. Lord, we thank you for this, and we thank you for the safety that you've placed on us and the blessings that you've given us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Uh, will you take your Bibles and turn with me to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. We're in Matthew, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. We're going to be here for two more weeks after today, uh, looking again at Jesus teaching on uh, the end times, and specifically we've been looking at the Olivet Discourse. Excuse me. Now you may say, Somebody was missing from praise team today. Sandy was missing. And I want to say hi, Sandy. I think you're watching this morning at this time. Uh, she's home. She tested positive for COVID. Just yesterday, she sent me, the, called me and told me the news. And I think it, hopefully it's a mild case. At least it's right now a mild case. So remember Sandy in your prayers. I hope that's okay, Sandy, to give it publicly. <laughs> but many of you know that already. But remember, Sandy, in your prayers. And why don't we just stop a moment and pray for our sister. Lord, we bring Sandy and many others who are still uh, suffering from this virus that has affected many. We ask your protection upon Sandy. May she find the rest she needs. May any treatments that she receives be effective, Lord. May your grace and your power just bless her abundantly. And others who are touched by this also virus, we ask their healing and protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, I want to start off, before we dig into the scriptures, a little test for you, okay? Uh, complete this, and then tell me who said this statement. If you fail to plan, you are... Go ahead, louder. Planning to fail. Now, who said that? You may have heard that often, that, that quote, but who said it? Who said it? I'll give you a hint. One of our founding fathers. Hmm? Very good, John. Did you know that or is that a guess? Okay. Winston Churchill was not one of our founding fathers. but Okay. Okay. Very good. But Benjamin Franklin, one of all, a very wise guy, man, I shouldn't call him a wise guy, but a wise man, uh, one of our founding fathers, and uh, it's a very good statement, isn't it? If you fail to plan, you're, failing to, you're planning to fail. And uh, that can be applied in many, many areas of life. Of course, you may think of your financial investments and future. Um, you may think about it in your job performance, carrying out your work, planning your work that day or week or month or an agenda ahead, uh, many other things. Uh, and if you fail to plan, you're going to most likely uh, fail. Let me share you the story of two men. One planned very well. The other failed miserably by not planning. Maybe you've heard your story, maybe you're not. This happens in 1911. It was the race to the South Pole. And um, there was two groups, a Norwegian group uh, led by, and I'm going to mess his name up, like you know I always do names, 
and I did not misspell his name. You think it's Ronald, but it's not. It's Ro Roloud, uh, M. M. Lundinson, and Robert Falcon Scott. For our purposes, I'm going to call them Ro and Bo. Okay, you got it. You know who's who, Ro and Bo. But uh, they're two explorers, and let me tell you their story because it does pertain to the idea of planning. And one failed, one very, was very successful in their planning. The race to the South Pole in 1911 between the successful expedition led by Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen and the failed one led by Robert Falcon Scott. Again, I'm calling them Roe and Bo, okay? On paper, it was a perfectly matched competition. Uh, they are of similar ages, the leaders. They boasted plenty of experience in polar exploration, but none, neither had made it to the South Pole. They set off days within each other, and it was reasonably assumed that they would meet there at the same time if everything went well. It appears that they didn't share common plans. Okay, They each chose their path. They each chose their plans, their provisions. So before we continue, let me give you some of the hardships they would face as they went on this race to the South Pole. Uh, there would be gale force winds, temperatures of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, facing that on your trip. Again, we're not talking they're in trucks or motorized vehicles, okay? They're not using them. So here's what they're going to do. Then also, um, the round trip journey will be about 1,400 miles. Um, many of the challenges uh, would be there today, even with our modern equipment. But this was in 1911. So let me share with you these two men and the comparison of their planning. Okay? Again, Roe and Bo. Roe learned that dogs thrive in Antarctic conditions and spend time with the, and he spent time with the Inuit people of the, in the north of Canada to learn dog sledding. That's Roe. Bo selected, get this, a mixture of ponies which are entirely unsuited for Antarctic conditions. Uh, and they had some motorized sleds, but it just wasn't going to work. Uh, the, the motorized sleds broke down, okay? Um, Roe ran with a team of dogs to the pole and back. Bo's team, they pulled the sleds themselves eventually. The ponies were not useful. Uh, the motorized sleds weren't very well. So they had to pull the sleds along themselves. Roe laid down supply chashes along the route and marked them with black flags so they would be visible for miles on their way back. Scott did not. Bo stored three tons of supplies for five men starting out. Bo stored one ton for 17 men. Got that comparison? Okay. Uh, somebody did. Three tons of supplies for five men, whereas one ton for 17 men. See the poor planning? Roe carried enough extra supplies that he would be able to miss every one of his stock supplies and still complete his journey. He oversupplied. Bo, he missed if he missed any one of his stock supplies, it would be the end of him and his team. Roe brought four thermometers. Bo brought one, and it broke. While both men knew they were only no way to remove all the risks, Roe prepared for the very worst weather in the most challenging geographic conditions where Bo appeared to have operated in hope that everything would work out all right. And in his journal, discover, in his journal we discover that 
it was all, he complained about bad luck. On December 15th, 1911, Rowe and his team planted the Norwegian flag in the South Pole. Uh, it would have probably have stunned Scott and his expedition, but they were 360 miles still to go from the pole. Uh, it would take Scott another 34 days to get to the South Pole. Uh, Rowe's team was just eight days from the home base when Bo got there to his, got to the South Pole. Sadly, uh, Scott's team, exhausted, depressed, frostbitten, near starvation, made it. I mean, excuse me, Scott's team uh, were exhausted, depressed, frostbitten, and near starvation. Their frozen bodies were discovered in a tent eight months later. So one planned and was successful. The other didn't plan adequately and ended in misery. So that is just one story in, the, in history that we have of planning to fa fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And that brings us to really our parable that Jesus teaches us today in Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, where he gives us an example spiritually of those who fail to plan, okay? And the setting is a wedding. And there's a bridegroom. And in Scripture, the bridegroom is usually pictured as God or Christ. Okay, and that's what we're going to see in this picture. Because Jesus, again, is talking about his return. And he's going to talk about that in the parable. And there's going to be a wedding. And there's going to be a feast. And if you look at the book of Revelation, there's a talking about a feasting time and those who have been invited to the ceremony and the feast. There's no real mention of the bride in this parable. Uh, it's kind of an assumed thing that she's there, okay? And typically in the scriptures, what do you find in the New Testament? Who is the bride? Bible students, who's the bride mentioned? The church, okay? So Christians, the church, they're... And uh, with this bride is a party of, we call them, they're labeled the virgins, or you could say the um, bridesmaids, okay? They, that's interchangeable terms there. So some of the similarity with our wedding ceremonies in some ways, but there's a lot of difference, okay? And um, most times in the back long ago, marriages were arranged, and when a date is set by the families, the groom, he and his men are, and family are preparing for the celebration. They will now then process to the bride's home and her part of the wedding party, the, the bridesmaids, or they're listed here as the virgins. And Jesus is using this familiar setting in his time to tell about his coming and the preparation for his return. So with that a little bit noted there, we're going to move in now to walk through these scriptures. Verse 1 of Matthew 25. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Okay, you get the scene there a little bit as we read? Okay, so Jesus says the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So they're with the bride. They're part of the party here. We, let's just call them their believers there as a representation. Um, five of them were foolish and five were wise. 
Jesus brings contrast to his parable. The foolish ones he identifies took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. So they didn't plan for any provision. They were only planning for a certain amount of time that their wicks of their lamps or oil of their lamps would have had only this certain amount of time. And they're hoping that the groom would come by the time that wears out. The wise, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps because they suspect maybe our wait's going to be longer than what we expected, okay? So the groom, by groom, was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So there's the bridegroom did not come at what they expected time that they thought, and eventually, like normal people, they got drowsy and fell asleep. And I don't really think I want to read into that part there, drowsing and fell asleep. Maybe some preachers and teachers may want to say that about how we are waiting and some just give up and that. I'm not going to do that. That's kind of a, just a normal thing. But verses 6 and 7, at midnight the cry rang out, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the, the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. Let me just give you an example of the lamps they may have used. And you can go to Israel. And uh, Rudy, you went to Israel a few times. Did you bring any of these home? I, I think they're numerous I hear out there. Uh, they're, they're clay and um, hollow. You pour oil in, you soak your wick, run it through the end here, and lights. Very simple lamp. And we imagine this is probably something that what Jesus was referring to. Okay, uh, or some picture it also maybe as torches. Either way, again, they, you're, there's the use of oil. There's a need for keeping it lit, or when it's to lit, you'll have something there to use. Okay, so we have this description here of the five wise and the five foolish, five planned, possibly. The return of the groom would be delayed, uh, but uh, and five says, well, he'll be coming soon. So by midnight, the cry goes out, the bridegroom's here, they go out to meet him. We think that possibly in ancient times there was this process that there was a processional from the bride's home to the groom's home, and the, 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 there would be these lamps, and uh, they would proceed with them, maybe holding them high, lighting their way, or even torches. That's why some would suspect torches. But they would go back to the groom's home where the wedding was, the feast was, and most likely uh, the groom prepared a place for his bride. And I think we see some symbolic imagery of Jesus there saying, in my father's house are many rooms. The groom built on to the house of his father's house to make room for him and his bride. So let's go on. Uh, verse 8. Verse 8. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us. And you, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they are on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. So, we have here the ones that were foolish and needed the oil, they asked, come and share with us. And the ones that were prepared said, no, we, we really can't. There not, may not be enough for both of us. And there's a principle here. Preparedness can neither be transferred or shared. If you're going to be prepared for Jesus' return, you can't share other person's faith. You can't share the work they're doing to prepare you will have to prepare yourself for Jesus' return, okay? 
I grew up in a Christian home. How many of you heard this? I've grown up in a Christian home. We attended church every Sunday. We had the Ten Commandments posted in our home. We did prayer at dinner time. We even used the Lord's Prayer often. We did this. We did that. Kind of stating their religious pedigree. Maybe faith too. But when people tell me that, I'm more prone to ask them, can you tell me when you came to follow Christ? When was that moment you received Christ? Because you just can't live on your religious heritage. You cannot borrow on your religious heritage. Grandma, grandpa, mom and dad, siblings, they may have made that step of faith. But have you made that step of faith? Have you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord? You can't borrow from that. And the same thing in our story here. These ladies could not borrow the oil. They had to go and buy it. They had to uh, do what was necessary. Verses 11 through 13. Later, the others, say, others also came. So the ones that were prepared and were able to get to the ceremony, they went in, the door shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. And he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, some may say, that's cruel. That's cruel. Let me share something here I found in a, in a commentary, uh, the expositor's commentary, and their explanation of this. I don't normally do this, but I think it's important to do so. The refusal to recognize or admit the foolish virgins must not be construed as callous rejection of their lifelong desire to enter the kingdom. It is the rejection of those who, despite appearances, never made preparation for the coming of the kingdom. There are those that I want to get that ticket to heaven. We all do. We all want that entry into heaven. But is there more to being just saying, I'm getting ready? He's coming again. Yes. Let me read further from another commentary. The five virgins who have the extra oil represent the truly born again who are looking with eagerness to the coming of Christ. They have saving faith and determined that whatever occurs, be it a lengthy time, or adverse circumstances, when Jesus returns, they will be looking with eagerness. That's the five with the preparation and the oil. The five virgins without the oil represent false believers who enjoy the benefits of the Christian community without the true love of Christ. They are more concerned about the party than about longing to see the bridegroom. You know, ask somebody about heaven. Ask your family, your friends, yourself, consider heaven. What comes to your mind first? I hope some of the first things that come to your mind is you're going to meet your Savior Jesus face to face finally. And to really bow at his feet and humble yourself and thank him for forgiving your sins. Thank you for dying on the cross, rising from the, the tomb, and giving you a new, abundant, and eternal life. Not in, well, where's my house? Where's that mansion we sing about? Where's my room? Did my dog make it? You know, I get that question all the time. We've dealt with that, I think. But, you know, or where's so-and-so? And I think they're all good things. But again, why are you wanting to get to heaven? Well, I don't want to go to hell. But do you want to be with your Savior and the place that he's prepared for you? You know, someone just says, I, I secured my place, got my ticket. And that's all they find in their security. But we read here, Jesus used in the 
last part of the parable. Later the others came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Grab your Bibles, and I don't have it for the screen here, but Matthew 7. Please turn there, it's an important passage. Matthew 7. Verses 21 through 23. I'm sure you're familiar with the passage, but see it with me. Read it along as I read. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus speaking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Strong language there, friends. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven here in this parable. In verse 1, you'll see, he says that kingdom of heaven is like this. So I think it's very important that we see Jesus' explanation here. There will be some that are going to be left behind. Some that Jesus will say, I never knew you. But they say, well, I went to church every Sunday. I gave tithes, offerings, I sacrificed myself in time and effort. I did this, I did that. But Jesus says, I never knew you. Why? You've never sought him. You only wanted to do the religious thing. And again, there's nothing wrong with ritual and rites and, and things like that. But if they're not grounded in the faith and are expressive of our faith, then it's just they're hollow and empty, friends. Are you preparing for Jesus' return? Let me give you two questions, actually three, to help clarify this. If you turn over your sermon outline in the recalibrate section, you have these questions and these scriptures. And I want you to help me along with this. Either read the scriptures with me from your sermon outline or on the screen as we come to them. Question, in preparing for Jesus' return, have you found a new, abundant, and eternal life by receiving God's saving grace through faith in Jesus Christ? You can only answer these questions yourself. You can't borrow from family faith. You can't borrow from family heritage. This is between you and God. And you know these scriptures, but will you read them along with me honorably, proclaiming them? John 3, 16 and 17, together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Okay. There's only one way to salvation, one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. One way for your sins to be forgiven, it's by Jesus. And have, do you believe him? Have you received him? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, read that with me. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast. Again, there's nothing you can do to earn your place in heaven to receive forgiveness of your sins. Jesus did it all. But he tells us to come to him in faith and receive that grace that gives us new life, abundant life, eternal life. What is your answer to this question? Next question. Have you committed yourself to following Jesus every day? This is involving the preparatory work for Jesus' return. Okay? There's more to saying, I got my ticket to heaven. 
and I've done this and I've done that. But are you really saying, should you be saying, Jesus did this for me? And through me, Jesus is working. Have you committed yourself to following Jesus every day? Luke 9, 23 through 25. Will you read it with me? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Friends, does that describe your life? I hope it does. Deny of self, deny self, pick up a cross and follow Jesus. Becoming less and less selfish and self-centered and more about what does Jesus want me to do today? How does he want me to prepare for his return? What should I be doing and be found doing when he comes? Okay. A few weeks ago, I talked about the preppers, just as an introduction, I think, to the series here. And there's nothing wrong with people preparing for, you know, crime and war and devastation and, and, and you know, terrible natural phenomenon of weather and stuff. Like, they're supposed to be helpful. You know, I just got, a thing a text this week from the uh, Red Cross and about her, this is hurricane season, and now how to prep and prepare for hurricane season. Well, that's probably a very wise thing to do. But again, when we look at our spiritual life and our faith, how are you preparing for Jesus' return? Supplying of foods, weapons, currency, gold, the shack in the woods that you're going to run to, it may be a, you know, something. But if that's what all you're focused on, friends, you're losing it. You're losing the reality of what we're being told here in Scripture, what to do. That we're to be living and following Christ every day. How do you answer this question? And I have another question that's not on the screen. When Jesus returns, will, you, will he find you prepared for it? Where he, will he find you prepared for his arrival? Will he say, come my, my servant into the kingdom with me? Or will he say, I never knew you. But you're going, but, 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 I did this. But, but, but have you ever received Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Another question, another scripture for preparation. I skipped over this, but I want to get back to it. Romans 12, 1 and 2, a scripture that I'm sure you know, and I hope you memorize. Read it with me. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This verse, these verses really tell me some things, two things that we should be doing. Worshiping, and being discipling, okay? First part talks about you being a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that you're living separate from the world. That's what it means holy, sacred, separate. You know what? The, a lot of times we look, the church, we look at the world and say, how are they doing it? And we, we apply it to the church. I think we got it backwards. The world should be looking to us about how to live, how to conduct life. There's some very good things out. There's a common grace and wisdom that is in the world that God's given mankind. But definitely the body of Christ has the revelation given to us on how to live. 
The world should be curious and want what we have. But a lot of times, friends, they don't see us as different. And I've told you this before. Maybe you get tired of it. I'm going to keep driving it home. We must be different from the world. Being a living sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's where we're worshiping in how you live. Not just in these four walls, but how you live. And do not conform to the pattern in this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's discipleship. I hope you're getting discipleship when we come into the time of worship, too, through the Word, but that when you leave here, you ponder what we've shared with you, you're challenged by it, and then you will make those changes and live what God's calling you to do. And then in your individual time with God, in Scripture, in prayer, in devotion, you're hearing Him speak. And you're more becoming more into Christ's likeness. You're in a Sunday school class or a Bible study or a discipleship course here or in other offerings anywhere you find. Please do that. Now, you're not understanding what discipling means. I really want you to do is just tear off a piece of paper today, write your name and phone number on it. I know who you are, but it's going to remind me to make contact with you. And just write discipleship. Okay, and we can talk about you know, some discipleship, I can do some one-on-one -on -one with you or we can join a group together, something like that. If you, again, need the more understanding of it, I want to share that with you. So please, do reach out to me on that. We need to be worshiping. We need to be discipling. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Just an end note on the idea of discipleship and knowing God's will. You've been given three things to equip you to understand God's will. Prayer, your conversation with God. Bringing your questions, bringing your fears. Yeah, those worries that we're not supposed to have. Concerns. Life situations, you bring it in prayer. To know what His good, pleasing, and perfect will is. You, you, you read the Word. We have the Word of God, the revelation of God. That is how we know God's plan and will. And we also have the Holy Spirit. We can't forget the Holy Spirit, especially on Pentecost Sunday. You, have, as a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit there. God, part of the, the Trinity, is living and dwelling in you. And He's there to speak, you and God, speak to you and guide to you. That's how we are to be living and preparing for Jesus' return. Again, when Jesus returns, will he find you prepared for his return? Will you be part of the wise who are preparing? Are you going to be part of the foolish that he'll say, I really never knew you? Which is your answer? We're going to end with a song that's very popular right now on Christian radio. It's simply called Jesus is Coming Back. It's by Jordan Felice. And there's many other singers. You may recognize their voices, but he's the main singer. But the message again is, are we ready? And you're going to hear that often in the song, are you ready? Are you ready for his return?
Stand, will you? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this very simple story about preparation. And there are those that will prepare and those that will fail to prepare. There will be those that are received into the banquet and those that will be left outside. And we all have an answer to the question, are we ready? Show us truly that we're ready for your return and that we're about doing the work you have for us individually and as a church, and as households, as we wait for your return. May we not be foolish. May we be wise in how we live, how we worship, how we are discipled and found to be denying self, picking up a cross, and following you daily. Help us, Lord, in that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. To, a, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.